Okay, I think I'm running. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to talk today about the second method for determining rate laws. Last time we talked about the method of initial rates, which uh, involved measuring reaction rates at a series of different concentrations. This one happens to be my favorite, integrated rate laws, uh, Atkins 17b. And essentially, this is a guess and check. That's why I love it. Um, you don't have to, to do anything. You just sort of guess and check. And so specifically, uh, we're going to guess an order of reaction. We'll use the rate law to predict concentration versus time, and then check and see if the concentration follows the expected dependence. So let me walk you through this. Uh, here's how this works uh, for a first order reaction. Step one was to write the rate law. Uh, so I'm going to imagine A going to B. The rate law for this uh, was K times A. I know that because it's a first order. And if I write this in terms of uh, a differential expression, in terms of the disappearance of A, okay, from the first video, I know that this is equal to negative DA DT. It's negative because a is a reactant. This is a differential expression, right? so I can integrate it. And the way we typically do that, um, not the way we typically, the way you do it is to bring all of your A terms to one side and your T terms to the other. And so if I do that, it will look like this. Uh, and I'm just going to write it as DA over A equals minus KDT. Now we integrate it. So I'm going to integrate it from time zero to time t. Pull hash there. And at time uh, zero, this has a concentration of a naught. And at time t, this will have a concentration of a. A of t. So uh, dA over a. It's a natural log. And I'm just going to do this a at time t. A zero equals minus KT. The other way you'll often see this written is if I exponentiate both sides, um, I get something which looks like this. Uh, ignore that. A at time T equals A zero E to the minus KT. If you're a note taking person, put this in your notes and circle it. Right? This is telling me how the concentration of A changes with time for a first order reaction. Right? So that was step one and step two. Step three in this process was to um, look at the actual concentration and see if it follows this expected dependence. And so here you go. Uh, here are two different reactions. Right? Again, some sort of weird gas phase reaction. Uh, you can imagine measuring the concentration as a function of time, and then you plot it. And when you do this, I want to make sort of two points to you. Um, the first is that if you were to look at these plots, you know, this one looks better than that one, but they're both kind of okay, both kind of decay. And just like I've tried to emphasize in other places in the course, uh, when you evaluate order of reaction or integrated rate law expressions, you want to look at linear curves. So in order to evaluate reaction order, you must evaluate linear plots. And specifically for a first order reaction, right? I can look at an expression like this, natural log A equals negative KT. What this suggests is I want to plot natural log A versus T. And if I look at that same data set, and now I calculate the natural log of concentration or the natural log of concentration, I plot them. What you can see much more clearly is that, that this is not a straight line. Right. Uh, it's starting up here. 
and it's kind of going up there. It clearly is not straight. Whereas this plot is very, very straight. Um, and just as you would expect then, the slope of this plot is equal to the rate constant. I can evaluate it and I get 0.054 per minute. Point one. Point two is this. Uh, the question is, what does a rate constant mean? And we often write first order expressions in a slightly different form. Uh, so I'm showing you the other version of it here, a equals a naught e to the minus kt. I can also write that as a naught e to the minus t on tau. Tau is one over the rate constant, and we refer to it as the lifetime of the reaction. Right? So I can equivalently talk about the lifetime of the reaction. And specifically, the lifetime will tell me the amount of time that it takes to reach one over E of the initial population. So one over E is about 37%. You know, I start here at 10, 37 someplace down here. So I might predict that the lifetime of this reaction is, you know, whatever, less than 20 minutes. If I look on a natural log plot, one over E is one of these units. So I can go here from two to one. Tau is one of those. Uh, my lines aren't very straight, but you'll get the idea. Previously, we had derived from this slope that the rate constant was 0.054 per minute. If I look at the inverse of that, I get 18.5. This is all consistent. So we can talk about rate constants, we can talk about lifetimes of reactions, it's the amount of time uh, required to reach some things. Reactions with a very high rate constant have a large slope, have a small lifetime, and they are occurring quickly, they're turning over quickly. Conversely, reactions with a large lifetime have a small rate constant, and are turning over very slowly. So that's how you can think about lifetimes and rate constants. And this may have sparked another idea in your head that, that you've heard of. Um, this lifetime is, is the time that's required to reach 37% of the population. It's kind of an arbitrary number. It's based on the mathematical form of that. But what you might have heard of instead is not one over E, but what about the half-life, right? Uh, the time that it takes for a reaction to reach half of its initial concentration. And um, I'm going to describe that a little bit in detail to you here. Uh, I start at, at a concentration of one. Right? And if I want to talk about the half-life, right, what you can see from this is that 10 seconds, it's, it's um, 0.5. Right? So the half-life is 10 seconds. I now want to zoom in to this region. So I'm going to start here at 0.5 and look at this data set. If I start at 0.5 and I go half of it, 0.25, you'll see that the half-life is 10 seconds. Let's zoom in down here. Uh, so if I zoom in down here, so I'm initially at 0.032, half-life. Mm. 0.016 someplace down here, it's 10 seconds. But if I zoom in uh, way down here, something really small, right, in the end of this thing, well, look at this. The half life is 10 seconds. Da, 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 da. The point that I want to make to you, whoops, is that, that the slope of this curve on a natural log scale is constant, right? Uh, the amount of time that it requires to reach one over E of its population is constant. And so the half-life of first order reaction is constant. We'll derive this or I'll ask you to derive this on the homework, but this is the specific form of it, um, 0.693 tau. And one of the wonderful things about kinetics is that it has lots of applications. And so I'm gonna give you one of those now. Um, 
the fact that the lifetime is the lifetime of a first order reaction is constant is the basis of radiocarbon dating. Um, so radiocarbon dating was invented by this guy, Willard Libby, University of Chicago. Uh, you may know that living organisms uptake carbon <clears throat> at its natural isotopic abundance. Right? They're sort of cycling um, and uptaking carbon at its natural isotopic abundance. But when the organism dies, this stops. The radioactive decay is a first order process uh, and therefore the amount of carbon-13 present in dead organisms is some indication of its age. It's just once it died, it stopped uptaking and then it's just been decreasing uh, since that time. And because it's constant, this is true over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of years. And so the insight from this, <coughs> excuse me, has profoundly impacted our understanding of the natural world and human evolution. Um, it's, it was a wonderful insight and Willard Libby won the Nobel Prize in 1960 for this work. Right. All right, that was first order reactions. Let's talk about second order reactions. Uh, again, I'm not gonna do this for you here. I've asked you to do it on the worksheet, but you can see the final result. Um, if you're a note taking person, write this into your notes. Rather than an exponential expression, I now get a one over A expression equals KT. Or if I solve this for A, you get something that looks like this. And I wanna make a couple points to you about this. Uh, again, in order to evaluate reaction orders, you must evaluate linear plots. So here's that same data set, right? They both look kind of curvy. Maybe it's first order, maybe it's second order, who really knows. For a second order reaction, in order to evaluate linearity, what you are going to plot is 1 over A versus T. Um, <clears throat> so again, you can calculate those things for these two different reactions. You can plot things. And what you can see is that this is very, very, very clearly a straight line whereas this one has curvature. This is not a second order reaction, this one is. And again, evaluating the slope, rise over run, you get K.022 per molar per minute, which is exactly what you would expect. I wanna compare first order and second order reactions. Uh, so this is shown here. Initially, these have the same reaction rate the slope of these two plots is the same. But what you can see is over time, uh, a second order reaction slows down. Second order reactions do not decrease as quickly as first order reactions. This is on a linear scale. If you were to look on a logarithmic scale, right, this can result in several orders of magnitude difference in a relatively short period of time. So second order reactions are, are slower in some sense than first order reactions. Right? We can also think about the half-life. So this is the half-life for that same data set. Um, start at one, at 0.5, the half-life of the second order reaction is 14.4 seconds. You have to trust me on the math there, but, it, but it's slower than a first order reaction. Right? Half-life is longer. We're gonna do that same thing, where I'm gonna take this now and zoom in. And I'm gonna zoom in in this region. If I do that and I look at this data set, I can look at the half-life, so I start at about 0.6, I end up at about a little bit less than 0.3, and the half-life is now 28.9 seconds. We'll zoom again and look down here. And I started about, you know, 0.22. Half that's about 0.11. The half-life is now 58 seconds. Do it again. Half-life is 115 seconds. The point that I want to make to you uh, is that for second-order reactions, the half-life is not constant. 
So for first order reactions, the half-life is constant, but for second order reactions, it is not. And specifically, as concentration decreases, the half-life increases. You saw that in the previous data set. And in the limit that the concentration is approaching zero, the half-life will get infinitely long. So it can, it can last a while. So let me give you an application of this one. In the 1980s, a group of scientists were studying these obscure atmospheric reactions between chloral fluoral carbons, CFCs, and ozone. Why this was important, no one particularly knew, um, but that's what they were doing. And it turned out that a lot of these reactions uh, were second order, right? specifically the ones that, that destroyed the ozone, all second order reactions. And because they were second order reactions, that meant that the concentration of CFCs in the atmosphere would not naturally decrease but as it got really low, the lifetime got longer and longer and longer, and these CFCs persisted in the atmosphere. And the scientists recognized that this was a big problem, right? that the only way to get rid of the CFCs in the atmosphere was, was to stop inputting them. We had to stop using them. And so uh, their work, Right. resulted in the banning of CFCs in an incredibly short period of time uh, from their first report of these reactions to the uh, time that CFCs were banned internationally. It was like less than 10 years. And you know, I have two comments about that. The first is that uh, these guys, lo and behold, also won a Nobel Prize. They won a Nobel Prize in the 90s uh, for atmospheric chemistry and specifically the banning of CFCs. I actually had an opportunity to meet this guy, Sherwood Rowland. He's a really nice guy. The other thing which I think is always so interesting about this is the time scale about this. Um, they solved this problem in less than 10 years, okay, which was significant. And I'm often struck by uh, current discussions of climate change. There's a pretty strong scientific consensus uh, that this is a problem and we need to start thinking about a solution now. Uh, we've been working on this for about 40 years. And we haven't been able to do anything. So again, this is my, um, my plug for liberal arts education. We have to be good at science uh, and able to do these things, but we have to be able to communicate why what we're doing is important and how it's going to impact people's lives. All right. Um, in summary, I would tell you to look at this table, 17B.3. Uh, Atkins will summarize all of these different integrated rate laws for various types of things, and you should be familiar with how you can use them to calculate concentrations of reagents and evaluate reaction order and all of that stuff. All right, I'll stop here. <coughs> Excuse me. One more topic, uh, and we'll be done.